welcome to another Brain Cookies episode where we talk about the latest news, trends, events, and just general stuff happening around us. This is the fourth episode of Brain Cookies. Anyway, these are your hosts, Super Sweet and Fia the Sea Wing. Today we will be doing an interview with former FCC chairman Michael Copps, and we will discuss the FCC as well. Alright, so can we start talking about the FCC first? Yeah, if you've seen our last video on net neutrality, you now know that the FCC stands for the Federal Communications Commission. Yep. So what is the FCC for? The FCC is a federal government group of the United States. They were created on June 19th, 1934 so that the government had one group to control and or regulate state-to-state communications through radio, TV, cable, satellite, and wire. Oh, okay. Now that we have covered the basic data for the FCC, let's get on to the interview. Sure thing. So we have Michael Copps with us right now. Hi, Mr. Copps. Hi. Um, be- thank you for being here with us today, but before we ask you about your time as FCC chair, we were wondering if we could ask you a few questions about how you got to where you are now. Sure. Happy to respond. First of all, let me congratulate you on the the great work you're doing on net neutrality and bringing that to the attention of uh, of a lot of people. Uh, I've been in Washington for a long time. It's something I always wanted to do when I was uh, a little kid. And uh, many years ago, I came to uh, Washington to work for a United States (coughs) senator and worked for him for about 15 years, but wanted to uh, stay in Washington, and I ended up uh, doing a couple of other government uh, jobs. I was an an assistant secretary of commerce uh, during the administration of President uh, Bill Clinton uh, for just about eight years, and then uh, when he left town, a seat on the Federal Communications Commission became uh, available, and I had some friends up in the Senate, senators who suggested that I might be uh, suitable for that position, so uh, uh, I was nominated uh, for that and uh, then confirmed by the Senate, and that was back in the year 2001, and I served on the uh, Federal Communications Commission then for over 10, almost uh, 11 years, leaving uh, at the end of 2011, so it's a long time in Washington, uh, actually almost 40 years, but I've always believed that uh, there's really no higher calling than uh, public service, and you can do a lot of good uh, that way and try to contribute to the well-being and the, of the people and the expansion of uh, democracy, and I, I still believe that, even though we're in tough times now with our uh, government from my perspective, but we all have to try to stay involved and try to uh, uh, make the system ever more democratic as we go along. Yeah, that's uh, really, wow. that's really <laughs> impressive. Yeah, that is. Um, so um, <clears throat> you mentioned something about always wanting to serve um, at Washington from a young age. So were you always interested in social sciences? Yes, uh, I was interested as a young uh, as a young kid. I started getting really interested in politics, uh, twelve or thirteen uh, years old, and was you know doing correspondence with a lot of senators and congressmen and uh, things like that. Uh, originally, you know, when I was really young, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And uh, I did uh, study in the social sciences, particularly in history. And when I got to college, I came under the influence of somebody I really admired, who was my history teacher. And he convinced me to uh, go to graduate school on history. So uh, I did that. I got a, uh, a major in undergraduate school in history, and then I got a PhD uh, from the University of North Carolina in the United States history. And my first job before I came to Washington was uh, I was a history professor uh, for three years at Loyola University in uh, New Orleans. Oh, that's, wow. that's, um, that's amazing. So uh, 
since things have since a lot of things have been happening with the FCC recently, what do you think about the FCC right now? Well, to be perfectly candid, I think it's the worst uh, FCC, and I'm thinking particularly about the uh, majority commissioners, uh, probably that we've ever had. Uh, the FCC was making progress on a lot of issues and bringing broadband to uh, more and more people, particularly trying to bring broadband to uh, uh, those who uh, 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 are less well off and for whom it's a real stretch uh, to have something like that, to uh, bring them affordable and, and subsidized uh, uh, broadband, to get broadband into our schools and libraries through the E-rate program. Uh, we needed to do something on uh, consolidation in the media where fewer, where there are a few really huge giant companies that own a lot of stations that used to be local and independent, and I think that's been bad for our democracy. We can talk more about that if you like. And then, uh, uh, as bad as anything they've done, uh, uh, perhaps worse, is to reverse the movement we were making toward net neutrality. The previous FCC. Uh, before the Trump administration finally passed a good set of net neutrality uh, rules or open internet rules and I know we're going to talk more about that in a minute or two uh, but this new uh, com commission that came in under the chair chairmanship of uh, Chairman Pai and the Republican majority uh, has eliminated those rules and uh, I think that decision could do uh, irreparable damage to the chances of us having an open internet that uh, uh, treats everybody neutrally and treats everybody alike instead of, uh, instead of uh, giving special privileges to the more affluent or to uh, big companies or business associates of those uh, firms that bring us uh, the internet like uh, AT&T and Verizon and Comcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I'm, so, absolutely. so I'm disappointed with the current FCC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, now we know that you oppose what the FCC right now is doing, but um, right. what was it like to serve as FCC chair? I mean, because most of us don't know. Like, it was probably stressful, right? Okay, I was a uh, commissioner for, for a long time, as, as I said, almost 11 years. I was chairman during the uh, interim between uh, uh, the time that President Bush left office and President Obama came in and then for the first part of the uh, Obama administration. But being commissioner uh, uh, is really a fascinating uh, job. You get to meet a lot of the movers and shakers in the technology uh, community. You get to meet and uh, work with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, people representing the public interest, and you try to uh, use the position that you have to make sure that the American people know what's going on at the FCC, and also to make sure that the FCC is listening to the uh, American people, which doesn't uh, always happen, but it's... Uh, it's a really interesting job, and it's an independent agency, supposedly. Uh, and in my case, that meant as a commissioner, you know, I could pretty much speak for myself and make my own decisions and not have to report uh, to anybody uh, above that each commissioner is independent. There are five members of the FCC. Uh, three of those five represent the political party that is in control of the White House, and then two represent the opposition. And uh, right now, of course, the Republicans are in control of the White House, so they have a majority at the commission. But uh, there are two uh, other commissioners there right now, Jessica Rosenworcel and Mignon Clyburn, uh, who are Democrats, and they are uh, fighting the good fight to protect American consumers and to uh, protect an open Internet and to... Uh, uh, try to get broadband out to more and more of our fellow citizens. Um, okay, yeah, that that's definitely true. So, um, we understand that in 2011, you were against the decision to allow Comcast to buy MDC Universal. So, why right. is that? 
Okay, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, ever since I arrived at the FCC in 2001, I had been concerned about all of the consolidation that I mentioned earlier, a few big companies buying up smaller companies and smaller stations and a few big telephone companies uh, who were monopolizing uh, markets around the country and supplying not just telephone service, but uh, broadband uh, too. Uh, so I had voted against a lot of mergers before we got to the Comcast NBCU merger, but it was one of the biggest that ever came along, and I really thought that it should have been a wake-up call for the American people because this merger meant that you were taking Comcast, which was a distributor of broadband, who was responsible for tran the transmission of broadband and bringing it to your house, uh, like you know, like AT and T and Verizon, Comcast was a distributor, but they were joining forces with NBC Universal, which uh, which focused on content. So what you had here was a combination of one company getting control of so much of the distribution and the content. To me, that's, that's the definition of monopoly. If you control the distribution of something and the content or the product, then you have a monopoly. And, you know, the United States has fought that fight for a long time. We did it with uh, uh, oil, for instance, back 100, over 100 years ago when we passed antitrust uh, uh, measures that tried and broke up big monopolies like that. But fast forward, and here we were in 2011, all of a sudden blessing that kind of a merger, and I thought people really needed to uh, wake up. And I was particularly concerned because that issue was the future of broadband. And it's such a dynamic and opportunity creating technology, and uh, we, we wanted to see it work out that way uh, with people at the edges, so to speak, innovators and people who ran their own uh, websites or blogs uh, in control of their internet experience rather than having uh, uh, having a few big companies uh, uh, in control of that. So in any uh, long story short, uh, I did indeed vote against that merger. I was the only commissioner to vote against it. Uh, so that meant both the other Republican and Democratic commissioners uh, voted for it, and I would just point out, I don't want to make the story too complicated, but when it comes to consolidation of the industry, uh, too often uh, Democrats as well as Republicans have uh, supported that. There have been ex some exceptions, uh, probably more under the Democrats than the Republicans, but both sides have been, both parties have been guilty of uh, of encouraging that kind of consolidation and voting for it, and I just think it's uh, it's bad for consumers, but it's bad for for uh, citizens too. If you look, you know, we can talk about big companies buying up small companies, big radio stations like Clear Channel or big TV uh, networks buying up community uh, uh, stations. That means uh, it almost always translates into the big companies. Uh, cutting back on the newsroom or uh, uh, joining two newsrooms almost always results in firing of journalists and reporters because these huge multi-billion dollar deals have to be financed somewhere. So the owners of these big monopoly companies look around and they say, well, where can we cut costs? And one of the first places they look is in the newsroom. So we've lost probably between a third and a half of our uh, uh, newsroom staffs uh, over the last uh, 17 or 18 uh, years or so. And that means less journalism. That means we have fewer journalists really digging to hold the powerful accountable. It means we don't get journalists who really can dig into a subject uh, and spend a lot of time on it because we don't have that many uh, journalists. Uh, so instead of investigative journalism and real news, we get a lot of uh, uh, infotainment, as I call it, which isn't really news. We get up a lot of a lot of uh, opinion programming rather than straight, hard, uh, factual news. And I think it really uh, inures to the uh, detriment of the American uh, people. Democracy depends upon 
inform voters. And if we deny voters the news and information that they need uh, to make intelligent decisions for the future of the country, then we're not going to make intelligent decisions for the future of the country. And uh, goodness knows, I think the country's made some dumb decisions in uh, uh, recent years. But uh, be that as it may, we need to do a much better job of, uh, with our journalism, uh, build that uh, that craft up again. And we don't really have on the internet a model for to to uh, uh, to support that kind of journalism. Yes, there's a few sites that uh, that do a good job, but by and large, uh, the internet has not been able to replace the news and information that we had in traditional media 15 or 10 or 15 or, or 20 uh, years ago. So to me, it's a, it's a huge problem. I often, when I'm out speaking to groups, will uh, go around and say, what's the biggest issue to you? Uh, uh, and ask students or people in an audience that. And some may say education or lack of opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. uh, lack of equal opportunity, or maybe it's lack of health care, or maybe it's the environment or anything else. And I say, well, that's all well and good, but none of those issues are going to be successfully addressed uh, until we have a media that really covers them and brings the story to the American people. Yeah. And otherwise, they have no way of knowing about it. So that's why I say, it's fine for you to have that issue as your primary issue, but you better put the future of the media right up there close to it because everything hangs, in my mind, uh, on the future of, uh, of that uh, uh, media sector. Um, yes, definitely. We absolutely understand. Um, no, and that was a very interesting opinion, by the way. Something that would persuade us. So, um... Wait. So Sophia has another question for you. Um, okay, let's hear it. Well, okay, so... Oopsies. Sorry. Um, so, it sounds like you are definitely not in support of having uh, one person have all the power, correct? Yeah, I'm not in support of even a few companies exercising all that power when we used to have that power distributed among communities and local people could get local news and, uh, and all that. So yes, I'm very much opposed to uh, uh, monopoly or uh, markets where one person controls or even, uh, to use another term, oligopoly markets, which means uh, uh, just a few people control uh, an industry or a market. Um. So uh, now you work for Common Cause. Um, what drove you to uh, become part of this organization? Well, when I left the FCC, and I was uh, already uh, beyond normal <coughs> retirement range, but I felt uh, passionately about these issues, particularly the uh, media ownership and consolidation issues and the uh, open internet network neutrality issues, and I didn't want to say goodbye to those issues. I wanted to keep working on their behalf. And the folks at Common Cause uh, were of a similar belief that these were important issues, and uh, we kind of joined forces and began a uh, media and democracy reform program at, at Common Cause. And uh, that's what I've been doing uh, uh, for the last six years now, I guess, working uh, working with other public interest groups, working with concerned citizens uh, around the country. Yeah. To try to get news, to try to get the word out on what's happening and to uh, organize, uh, organize the people to demand change. You know, a lot of these issues inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway are very partisan. Democrats think one way, Republicans the other way. But when you get out around the country, beyond the Washington Beltway, you'll find that most people are supportive of uh, many of the things that I, I have just said. We have seen polls recently, for example, where uh, 70 or 80 percent of the people, Republicans as well as Democrats and independents, believe we should have a good uh, net neutrality, open internet system. 
We have seen polls. I saw a poll on the proposed merger between uh, AT&T and Time Warner, which is another one of those deals that looks a lot like Comcast and NBCU, uh, uh, where I guess one of the polls I saw said 65, 66% of Democrats oppose that merger and 65% of independents and 64% of Republicans. So it's, uh, it's not just one party thinks one way and another party thinks another way except here inside the Beltway where uh, where there's so much partisanship. And the reason we have so much partisanship is because of the tremendous and outrageous influence of the big special interests, big phone companies, big energy companies, big companies and all those industries and the money they put into the political bloodstream, the money they contribute to Congress, the money they put into uh, lobbying. Uh, so I think Washington, D.C. treats these issues very differently than people. It'll be interesting now to see, now that the FCC has eliminated FCC rules, what the reaction is going to be. And we already begin to see uh, governors and state legislatures and even municipalities, towns and cities around the country are saying, well, if Washington is going to run out on an open internet, we're going to pass our own uh, network neutrality protections. And that's that's very difficult to do, and, and uh, the states and the municipalities shouldn't be put in that position because this problem should have been resolved at the federal level and the network neutrality rules upheld instead of eliminated. But uh, it just shows that people are, uh, uh, are very troubled by what the FCC did. And I hope, I really hope and pray that uh, uh, politicians in Washington will uh, will perk up their ears and, and take notice of this. And I kind of am, am hopeful that that will happen. It will take a lot of organizing and a lot of input from citizens at the grassroots. But I think a lot of politicians are beginning to understand that it's not such a good idea to go around saying they're against net neutrality or against some of these things uh, because a lot of those candidates have enough baggage to take into the 2018 uh, uh, elections as it is, without taking on another issue where it's becoming clearer and clearer that a majority of the American people uh, are not in favor of what has happened in Washington. And the, the other hope is that the courts will uh, uh, upend and reverse this recent FCC decision. But it's very difficult to predict how different courts uh, decide, and that's a really long process, and one court can come down one way and then a higher court reverse it and it goes on and on but my hope is that the court will uh, reverse what the FCC did because it was such an outrageous action totally. and I'm talking about the net neutrality issue here totally uh yeah that was that was a really good opinion of yours so um we're out of time here but uh thank you Mr. Cops we really learned a lot today and we appreciate your time. We would love to have you back again soon. Well, I'd be happy to do that. I'm really proud of what you guys uh, are doing. The future of this country is uh, uh, your generation, and you really need to be uh, uh, full participants in uh, uh, discussions of the public issues, and uh, you can lead the way, and you can protect this internet, which is such an important tool to all of us, but particularly to the future of young people. Uh, if that's going to be our new town square of democracy on the internet, we have to make sure it is democratic, and that's what these issues are all about, and I'm just grateful that, that you're out there uh, discussing them, so it's an honor for me to uh, be with you tonight. And we really appreciate what you're doing for the country, so thank you. Yeah, and thank you're you. very welcome. Yeah, and thank you for what bye you said. Okay, bye. 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 We're gonna have to end this video here, so anyway, thanks for watching and tuning in everyone. We hope you found this video educational and informational. Be sure to tune in to our next video next Saturday. See you next time! Bye!